Turn this expression into an abstract syntax tree using Pratt parsing. Start with a simple test that parses a single digit. Tokens are produced by the lexer from an input string, and then the parser takes these tokens and turns them into nodes. The AST struct is simply a reference to the root node. The lexer works by skipping white spaces and turning single digits into atoms. In the parser, function parse abstracts setting the root field to the output of the helper function parse node. Next token and peak token are helper functions to iterate over the token slice. Parse node heap allocates a node, and that node holds the character of the next token, and then it returns a pointer to that node. The original Pratt parser paper says that this parser is initially positioned at the beginning of the input. It runs the code of the current token, stores the result in a variable called left, advances the input, and repeats the process. If the input is exhausted, then by default the parser halts and returns a value of left. To encode the AST, return the character of the root node as we simply expect one node for now. I called these functions in main so I can get zig build diagnostics from my LSP. You don't have to do this. Fix the errors, call zig tests, and our first test passes. Moving on to binary expressions, a token is now either an atom or an operator. Nodes now have optional arguments which are pointers to their child nodes. Every node is labeled with a token whose arguments, if any, are its subtrees. This is the distinction between an atom and a binary expression. After parsing an atom, instead of returning immediately, we check if the next token is an operator. If it is, then we parse the right-hand side argument, heap allocate another node to hold this infix expression, and that is what we return instead. To encode these binary expressions, operator comes first, followed by the left and right argument, and then we enclose these in parentheses. These are the rules for encoding an AST. The notable ones are that the order of arguments in the tree is preserved, so left to right, be consistent with prefix notation wherein the operator precedes its arguments. If we settle for plus a comma b, we may not use a plus b as well. Lastly, syntactic tokens like parentheses must be present at the beginning and end of a subtree string. Next, we'll parse multiple infix expressions. To determine the priority between two operators, we use binding powers. Binding powers are properties for operators, and there is a left and a right binding power. In this case, the left binding power of an add operator is 1, and the right will be 2. If the left binding power of the current operator is less than the right binding power of the previous operator, then it will not take priority over the previous expression. Create a function that returns the binding power of a given operator. Change parse node to take in a minimum binding power. Function parse will start the recursion by giving a minimum binding power of 0. After parsing an atom and the next token is an operator, evaluate the binding power of the next operator. Compare the left binding power of the next operator to the minimum binding power of the current function scope. If it's greater than the minimum, then we continue parsing by recursively calling parse node, passing in the right binding power of the next operator. The variable left may be consulted by the code of the next token, which will use the value of left as either the translation or value of the left-hand argument, depending on whether it is translating or interpreting. If a token is preceded by an expression, we call the code denoted by that token led and without a preceding expression, we call it NUD. Our while loop is a LED, and the code before that would be the NUD. We shall also change our strategy when asking for a right-hand argument, making a recursive call of the parser itself rather than of the code of the next token. In making this call, we supplied the binding power associated with the desired argument, which we call the right binding power, whose value remains fixed as this incarnation of the parser runs. 
the left binding power is a property of the current token in the input stream and in general will change each time state Q1 is entered. The left binding power is the only property of the token not in its semantic code. To return to Q0, we require right binding power to be less than left binding power. If this test fails, then by default the parser returns the last value of left to whoever called it, which corresponds to A getting E in AEB if A had called the parser that read E. If the test succeeds, the parser enters state Q0, in which case B gets E instead. Without changing the logic, adding another operator with the same binding power defaults to left associativity. Adding multiplication and division is easy. Just set their binding power is higher so they take priority over addition and subtraction. For right associativity, make the left binding power higher than the right binding power. This approach is called operator precedence. A number should be associated with each argument position by means of precedence functions over tokens. These numbers are sometimes called binding powers. The idea is to assign data types to classes and then totally order the classes. We now insist that the class of the type at any argument that might participate in an association problem not be less than the class of the data type of the result of the function taking that argument. Finally, we adopt the convention that when all four data types in an association are in the same class, the association is to the left. Let's add a prefix operator to denote the sign of a number, negative or positive. Now the left and right arguments can be null independent of each other. Give prefix operators the highest priority by making the right binding power the highest among all operators. Set the left binding power to zero since this is a one-sided argument. Update parse node to handle an atom or an operator on the first token. It's the same idea for postfix operators. But we update the infix and postfix functions to return an optional since an operator can be any of these two during our while loop. A minor mistake here. Postfix should be checked first before infix. It's fine in our case since there's no overlap between infix and postfix operators. Like how in prefix and infix, both have the minus operator. Let's now support array indexing, which is a postfix binary operator. Simply add an if statement in the postfix evaluation. After parsing the right argument, we assert that the next token is the closing bracket. Supporting parentheses is the same concept, but this time we always call parse node with the minimum binding power of zero. This ensures that the expressions inside the parentheses take priority over everything else. The node of left parentheses will call the parser and then simply check that the right parentheses is present and advance the input. Adding ternaries takes a little more effort, but it's the same concept. Update node arguments with a new middle field. Now this is a combination of our delimiter examples. Parse the expression between the question mark and the colon operator with a minimum binding power of zero. Assert the next token to be colon and then parse the right argument. One fundamental aspect of Pratt parsing is to ensure that all arguments are separated by another token. Now this is already intrinsic to binary operators like addition and subtraction. But when it comes to variable arguments, like the ternary operator, which has three arguments, we need to ensure that each argument is delimited by another token. In this case, the colon operator separates the middle and the last argument. When a token has more than two arguments, we lose the property of infix notation that the arguments are delimited. This is a nice property to retain, partly for readability, partly because complications arise. For example, if minus is to be used as both an infix and a prefix operator. Left parentheses also has this property. As an infix, it denotes application. As a prefix, it's a no-op. Accordingly, we require that all arguments be delimited by at least one token. Such a grammar, Floyd calls an operator grammar. For example, the nut of if when encountered in the context of if a then b else c may call the parser for a, verify that then is present, advance, call the parser for b, test if else is present, and if so, then advance and call the parser a third time. 
Now let's use the expression from our intro as our final test. These are six properties of Pratt parsing, which summarizes the implementation details of the paper. Okay, now let's have some fun. Let's optimize our little Pratt parser. Currently, each node takes up 40 bytes on 64-bit machines and 20 bytes on 32-bit machines. Let's confirm this by asserting the size at compile time. Move the binding power and lexer structs to separate files. We won't be touching these as we try different implementations of the parser. Create a text file that contains all input from our tests. In main.zig, parse each line 10,000 times. Using an arena allocator, we accumulate all the memory through each iteration and we only free memory on program exit. Let's benchmark our program. The most important metrics are wall time and peak RSS or peak memory. Using a slice instead of individual pointers for each argument brings down our memory from 40 bytes down to 24. Just a simple change and we've reduced our memory usage in half. Now instead of using pointers, let's manually manage our heap allocated nodes in a dynamic array. To keep track of the children of a node, we need to use another dynamic array. The args field is a dynamic array of indexes, and these are indexes into the nodes field. And what this does is constrain our previous use size pointers to 4 byte integers as indices. Now each node only takes up 8 bytes of memory on both 32-bit and 64-bit systems. Benchmarking our optimization against the slice parser, it uses the same amount of memory with worse performance. We have to remember that even though each node only takes up 8 bytes of memory, we've also been allocating dynamic arrays to keep track of our nodes. And in my implementation, I appended all nodes to the args dynamic array. This meant that each node was actually taking up 12 bytes of memory on top of the overhead of creating dynamic arrays in 10,000 iterations. Let's see if we can keep track of the child nodes without using a second dynamic array. Looking at the actual indices of the child nodes, we can see that they're all next to each other, so we only need to keep track of the first argument. And we can calculate an offset for the rest of the arguments instead of memoizing it. One caveat in ternary expressions, where if the middle argument is its own subtree instead of an atom, then the third argument of the ternary will not be next to the first two. So we can't eliminate the second dynamic array but we'll only use it to track the arguments of the ternary operator. We only append the first argument and the last argument, and we can calculate the index of the second argument, just like the rest of the operators. Now it uses 38% less memory than the slice implementation of the parser, albeit with a 10% slower performance. Alright, hope this helps.